The forests near the equator are also witness to another landmark in evolution. The first simple flowers have arrived, adding a dash of color to an otherwise green world. It is the start of a new relationship with insects. Attracted by the color and smell, this wasp is feasting on the pollen within, but will unwittingly spread it to other flowers, speeding up the plant's reproduction. The plants that have evolved this feature are beginning to flourish and soon will dominate the flora of the world. Sexual reproduction is a driving force for evolution. The swapping of genetic material allows the offspring to be unique from the parents, promoting genetic variation in populations and assuring greater ability for populations to adapt to new environments and speciate. For most of history, reproduction for plants has been a passive process, with genetic material from male parts at the mercy of the wind, or asexual reproduction generating a monoculture within a species as a result of low genetic variation. Despite multicellular plants emerging 470 million years ago, it was only less than 170 million years ago that we see a truly successful sexually reproductive strategy in plants, in the form of flowers. The strategy has proven so successful that today, angiosperms, the group that contains flowering plants, makes up 90% of terrestrial plant species. The strategy works by taking advantage of the animals in their respective environments to spread their pollen, attracting the animals with a sugary substance. While nectar is costly to make, it is a worthwhile investment in assuring that each plant gets to pass on its genes. Further investments are made in the production of fruits, the ultimate result of every flower, and the greatest method in utilizing animals in seed dispersal. This intimate relationship has become so mutually codependent that many flowers can only be pollinated by one or a few animal species, and some animals can only feed on flowers. Currently, the oldest known evidence of flowers comes from a fossil in China, named Flora germanis jurassica, in reference to it being among the first flowering plants discovered from the Jurassic, dated to around 164 million years ago. Jurassic angiosperms are rare in the fossil record, with the bulk of early flowering plants coming from the mid to late Cretaceous, primarily as small herbaceous plants, while the position of trees was still dominated by conifers. It wasn't until the onset of the Cenozoic, after the collapse of the Earth's ecosystems caused by the KPG extinction, that most of the tree forms of angiosperms would evolve. Aside from preserved fruiting bodies, the anatomy of flowers is usually distinct enough to be easily identified. Flowers grow in patterns, with each layer growing successively after the other, sprouting from a structure called a floral meristem. The basic parts of a flower can be broken down into the sepal, petal, stamen, and carpal. The stamen and its collective parts are male-specific, while the pistil and its parts are female-specific. While some species are separated by sex, around 95% of current species are hermaphroditic, possessing both male and female structures. This cross-fertilization between individuals doubles the amount of offspring produced. Reproduction happens first via a sporophyte producing one or two types of spores in a process called heterospory. The male spores germinate on the parent and develop into pollen, where development is then halted. The female spores germinate and develop into ovules, the plant's eggs, where they take on a stage known as a gametophyte, retained in the parent. The male stamen disperses pollen from two pollen sacs each. When it has made contact with the female pistil, the pollen is transported through pollen tubes into the ovary. There, a pollen grain will pass through the carpal and fertilize the ovule. Upon initial development of the embryos, the ovary will swell and become the fruiting body. Surprisingly, the structure of flowers is not quite as unique as it may appear. A similar and more basal structure can be found in the angiosperm's close relatives, the gymnosperms. Gymnosperms have an analog to flowers, that being their cones. These cones are used in reproduction much in the same way as flowers, but they disperse pollen from a male cone, a separate structure from the female cones. The pollen will passively float through the air, aided by small air sacs on each pollen grain. The female cones contain ovules just like flowers, but the ovules are external and not encased in a carpal. These ovules will fertilize with any pollen that happens to float through the small openings, and after pollen is received, the female cone closes completely, where then the scales of the cone will swell, then harden. 
When the seeds are fully mature, gaps will form allowing the seeds to be dispersed. While most gymnosperms are hermaphroditic, a few groups like cycads are dioecious, having separate male and female individuals. Like flowers, cones sprout from a special meristem along the stem of the plant separate from the shoot meristems. The scales of cones grow in a repeating pattern of radial symmetry, like the separate parts of a flower growing along a central axis. In flowers, however, each of these layers is defined by a particular gene and expressed by a separate hormone. These four layers are referred to as whorls, with each one developing into one of the four main parts, the sepal, petal, stamen, and carpal. This specific pattern is regulated by a homeotic gene. While browsing dinosaurs grew in size and range, plants were undergoing their own evolutionary breakthrough. This is Westwater Canyon in Utah. Ancient plant fossils of an entirely new variety have surfaced here. Neither a tree fern nor a gymnosperm, these plants had oval-shaped leaves. Their arrival would revolutionize the plant kingdom and in time alter the ecology of the earth. Genetic analysis confirms a direct relationship between angiosperms and gymnosperms, but morphological evidence in the form of fossils is very lacking when it comes to transitional forms between the two. The closest extinct group known in the fossil record is the Benetitales, and they too had advanced flower-like structures, with designated organs for pollen and seed production, represented heavily in early dinosaur paleoart with their cycad-like leaves. But after them, the closest group to angiosperms are actually another living group known as the Natales. While not as successful in today's ecosystems, they occupy a wide range in Africa and Asia, with smaller ranges in South America and Indo-Pacific islands, typically living in tropical rainforests or deserts. Their cones have a lot of similarities with flowers, with each one sporting both pollen and seed producing organs, and sometimes even possessing pigmentation. Also like flowers, they have intimate relationships with insects, attracting them with nectar. They don't, however, produce fruiting bodies, lacking an ovary. The Natales are an interesting transitional group, and we are lucky to have them with us today, but their cones represent only one step in the many proposed transitional forms that led to the first flowers. For most of history, relationships between insects and plants have been entirely parasitic, and this is likely how the first relationships between early flowers and flying insects began, with beetles and early representatives of Hymenoptera feeding on the buds and cones for their lack of defenses, likely also feeding on the nutritious pollen. But at a certain point, this feeding strategy for certain insects became advantageous for the plants, and by attracting them with a sugary enticement evolved from the same sticky solution used to catch pollen, the insects would inevitably spread the pollen, precluding any severe damage to the plants while speeding up their reproduction. This formed mutual relationships between insects and plants unlike what had ever previously existed, ones that promoted extreme specialization for both the angiosperms and the insects. Two groups of insects in particular, Lepidoptera, the group that includes moths and butterflies, and Hymenoptera, the group that includes bees, wasps, and ants, were major influences on the development of flowering structures, promoting pigmentation, with bright colors alerting pollinators to the most fertile flowers, and deeper nectaries, rewarding more pollinators with the energy-rich solution. This strategy is a faster and more efficient one than the passive reproduction of gymnosperms, likely determining the growth of their dominance across the globe. During the Cretaceous, for the very first time, there was a partnership that was established between flowering plants and insects. Uh, before that time, it was an antagonistic relationship. The insects were eating the plants. Uh, but with the evolution of flowering plants, a kind of hand and glove relationship began to evolve. Flowers started changing their reproductive structures to accommodate the insects that were visiting them, and insects were beginning to change their morphology, their shape, to accommodate the visiting of flowers. Nectar produced by flowering plants was a powerful lure for their partners in evolution. New insects like bees and butterflies appeared, and with them, new methods of pollination. Today, 
Many flowers have specialized to the point of dependency on a single species of pollinator, with many of those same animals specializing in a single species of flower. Accommodating only one species of pollinator can assure that flower a selective advantage over their neighbors, rewarding them with exclusive access to a source of food. But equally viable is the strategy of luring as many pollinators as possible, being a one-size-fits-all for most species, like many beetles, wasps, and mammals that don't solely depend on flowers, but are still drawn by the color and taste. Flowers can also be arranged variably on a plant, favoring different types of pollinators. Pollination is only one half of the partnership, however, with entirely different relationships formed around the dispersal of seeds. Fruit is a unique trait to angiosperms, and one that cannot exist without flowers. The swelling of the ovary with sugars, proteins, lipids, and water gives the seeds a head start in germination by feeding animals and allowing the seeds to pass through their digestive tract, both giving the seeds fertilizer to start with and by carrying the seeds far out from the competition zone with the parent. Triggered by the production of ethylene, the fruit ripens, reducing acidity, increasing pigmentation, and converting starch into sugar contents. This relationship has best developed with birds and mammals, with the size of the fruit often affected by the size of the local herbivores, increasing the plant's caloric investment to better guarantee the success of their offspring. This cooperative effort between plants and animals promoted a vast diversification of the two, generating forms of color and shape never seen elsewhere in the flora of eons past, permanently altering the Earth's ecosystems and adding a dash of color to an otherwise green world.